All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Matt. As I mentioned earlier, I'm a former member of the Flutter team at Google. Uh, and for the past few years, I've been doing contract development, open source development, consulting, training, kind of all the Flutter and Dart stuff you can imagine. My primary focus these days is on an organization called the Flutter Bounty Hunters, which is why I'm dressed like this. I'm the chief of the Flutter Bounty Hunters, and we work exclusively on open source Flutter and Dart packages, and I'll circle back at the end to give you a little more information about that. Now, usually when I come to this meetup, I talk about <clears throat> Flutter UI topics. Tonight, I'm actually gonna talk a little bit about static sites and regular Dart programming instead of Flutter. <clears throat> Let's start back, uh, take a real quick tour of the history of websites, if we can. Back in the day, all websites were static. And let me show you what that really means in practice. Let's take some, some web page that you visit. What would the web server actually do when you visit that web page? The web server would function as a glorified file server. You request, in the, you know, let's say an index.html page, so the web server goes into some public directory and says, oh, there's the index.html page gets served back to the browser. And the browser looks in there and says, oh, we also want this favicon. Ask the web server again for the favicon, looks up the file, sends it back. <clears throat> Same thing with a header image. So web servers in the early days were little more than file servers. The browser says, give me this file. <clears throat> the web server looks in the file system, returns it. But this obviously couldn't work forever, especially when we had the introduction of e-commerce and social media to the web. So for example, let's take Amazon. Are they really gonna hire somebody to write the HTML for every product page in their entire marketplace? Obviously not. And this became a forcing function for how browsers and web servers actually interact. And so at this point, what we see instead is that the browser requests some kind of URL, some kind of path, but instead of looking at a file system, the web server is now gonna run some kind of query for it into a database, like a MySQL database. That's gonna return some data. That data is then going to be hydrated with something like PHP. So PHP is this preprocessor for HTML, where you can take HTML, inject little bits of PHP. The PHP takes the data that came back from the, the database query, puts it in the HTML, and then the HTML is returned to the browser. And in this case, there is no HTML file for this product. There is HTML returned, but there is no file on the file system, at least short of caching this value. It's literally assembled on the fly, and this is what we call a dynamic website. Then everything became dynamic because programmers don't know how to partition solutions to specific problems. So they said, well, let's make all the things on the web dynamic. And that's when we ended up with WordPress and Drupal and Joomla and these wiki technologies. And all of these things were deploying that the fabled LAMP stack, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Everybody on the web was always deploying the LAMP stack and then installing these dynamic systems. But then we look back at these kind of simple marketing pages and news websites and blogs and documentation websites and web designers started to realize a few things. First, they realize that these articles that they publish, they sure don't change very often. You tend to write them once, you push them, and then you're done. Unless you're a news website that screwed up the story, then your editor has to come in and make some changes, but that's about it. Additionally, dynamic websites are a lot more complicated than static websites. It takes a lot more technologies and skill and, and upkeep. And databases are expensive. Again, compared to just serving up an existing HTML file, running databases costs a lot more money. And finally, when you place this entire dynamic system on a website, think about the admin panel for a WordPress website, you introduce all of these security concerns. That's why WordPress, it seems like every week WordPress is announcing some kind of security patch because there's something about that admin experience that people can exploit. This then led to what I would call kind of a static 2.0 where web designers rediscovered the value of simplicity, but they couldn't just return to the world of static web pages and websites because there really are some difficulties with these core browser technologies. All a browser understands is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. If you're serving up a static site, those are the types of files you have to serve. But writing HTML when you're a, a blog author is a pain. Writing CSS in general is a pain. 
So web designers learned some lessons from the world of dynamic websites, and they were able to bring those into the world of static website development. So for example, if you're an author, it's a lot easier to write Markdown than it is to write HTML. It's a lot more brief. You don't have to, you're not constantly trying to pick the right HTML tag for the semantic meaning of this portion of this paragraph. You can just sit down and write what you need to write as an author, and you're not bothered by highly technical details. Also templating, what was proven with PHP and Ruby and some of these other technologies, templating is hugely useful. Because if you're writing a blog, you might have a thousand blog posts, but they're all embedded in the same HTML. So why are you writing the same HTML a thousand times? What you really want is to write the HTML once, and then you inject every one of those blog posts into that HTML. And similarly, not only can you inject you know, your titles and your descriptions and your content, but you can have little bits of HTML that you then inject as components. So you have the same nav bar across all of those blog pages. Uh, as an advancement beyond CSS, so CSS, I actually don't know where it stands today, but for most of CSS's history at least, you didn't even have variables which means that there's some color that is repeated throughout all of your theming. You're literally repeating that color value, that hex value a thousand times. And then when your design team comes in and says, hey, we're rebranding, change the color, you get to go find that hex value a thousand times and replace it. Otherwise you have bugs in your theme. So then along came SAS, which is a superset of CSS. It's CSS plus more stuff. And now you have variables where you can define a color one time use it throughout all your style sheets. And when your design team shows up and says, change the branding, you change it one place and everything works as it should. SAS can then be compiled down into regular CSS. So the world of static websites begins to look a lot more like this. The authoring tools have diverged from the deployment tools. The browser still demands its HTML and CSS and JavaScript, but what you author tends to be marked down for content SAS for CSS or Tailwind CSS is now becoming popular. You have some kind of templating system, whether it's Jinja in this case, or Mustache or Handlebars, a whole bunch of templating engines. But what you do is you take these authoring tools and you use what's called a static site generator to kind of transform all of these pieces together into your traditional HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, which you then upload to the web server and now you're back to the glorified file server where a request comes in for an HTML file, the web server looks in the file system and spits back whatever is found in that file. We have the ease of authoring with the simplicity of static deployment. So a few months ago, I started working on some guide websites for Flutter developers. Um, for example, I'm, I'm trying to help Flutter developers learn more about how to create custom render objects. And I started looking through available static site generators because I went through kind of the same story. I wanted easy authoring tools, but I wanted to be able to deploy a very simple website so that developers could read these guides and learn how to do some of these things in Flutter. Now, if you go look for static site generators, the first one that you're probably gonna come across is called Jekyll. Jekyll might be the oldest, or at least one of the oldest static site generators. Uh, GitHub repositories actually have the ability to build and host static websites for your project. It's called GitHub Pages. And if you want the easiest, no configuration, no understanding about how it works, Jekyll is the one thing that's built in to GitHub pages. Not the only one you can use, but that's the one that's supported out of the box. Now, I think Jekyll is based on Ruby, if I remember correctly. But Jekyll is a static site generator that tries to allow you to generate these websites without actually understanding the internal implementation. So the idea isn't that you need to write a bunch of Ruby. There's a command line system that you use combined with their file system conventions, and then out pops that static website. So there are a lot of non-technical authors, for example, who use Jekyll. But I would say that probably today, Hugo has kind of taken the place of Jekyll, in my opinion. Again, Hugo doesn't require that you really understand the internal implementation. As you might have guessed from the name, the language it uses is the Go programming language. Uh, but here again, it comes with these command line tools. So you type the right command, you put files in the right directories, and out comes a static website. But as I was inventorying these options for these guide websites that I was building, I then came across Loom. 
I actually don't know if that's how it's pronounced, but it's L-U-M-E, so I'm going to call it Loom. And this is a static site generator written in a combination of JavaScript and TypeScript, and it uses the Dino build system. The interesting thing about Loom to me was that it was unabashedly a JavaScript and TypeScript and Dino project. Now, I can't stand JavaScript, but if I could, if I was a fan of that language, then this would probably be the static site generator that I would choose because I would feel right at home. When you create a Loom project, it is a JavaScript, TypeScript, Dino project. It has those dependency systems. You can hook into the package ecosystem. You're writing those languages. But it then got me thinking, why shouldn't the Dart community have that same power? Why shouldn't we have a static site generator in the Dart community that's unabashedly Dart? So about a month ago, I started working on a project called Static Shock. Static Shock is a static site generator written in Dart for the Dart community, unabashedly a Dart project. And I'll show you just a little bit about what kind of the Hello World experience looks like with Static Shock. <clears throat> so over here, we have an empty uh, directory. Okay, so I've opened VS Code. We have this Flutter Silicon Valley directory. There is nothing here. I want to show you what it looks like to get started with Static Shock. So I don't know how many of you have actually worked with Dart command line tools, but there's a really nice way to just pull Dart tools out of the ether, and that's using the Dart pub global activate command. It's a mouthful, but you can just pull a package out of pub and run it on your system. Let's do that now. I guess I'll try to type with one hand so this doesn't fly off the table. So Dart pub global activate, this is saying the Dart tool, pub is the central package repository, global is saying we want to do something across the whole operating system, the whole computer, not just this package. And what we want to do is we want to activate a package. And which package do we want to activate? We want to activate static shock CLI. What that's doing is it's going up to the pub server, it's finding a package that I published called Static Shock CLI, it's pulling it down, and now I can say which shock, and you'll see that right there in the pub cache, we have an executable called shock, and we can now run these static shock commands, for example, the command to create a new project. So let me clear the console, and now let's say shock create. And now it's going to ask a couple questions, like what do we want to name it? What's the description? So let's just say, let's just do Flutter Silicon Valley FSV FSV demo for the description. And then notice that over here on the left, we suddenly have a bunch of files that weren't here a moment ago. This is your beginning, your most basic static shock project. And a few things I want you to notice here is that this is a normal Dart project. It's not a special static shock project. We're not hiding the language or the package ecosystem from you. Right here is a pubspec.yaml file, like you'd get in any other Dart project. Here we have a bin directory with a Dart file, like you'd have in any other Dart project. We have Dart analysis options. We have the standard, well, actually it's not the standard get ignore, but it is a get ignore that, it, that you can see here is ignoring the Dart tool configuration, which you would expect from a normal Dart project gitignore. Now, there, the only thing that's unusual is this source directory. And this is the beginning of your website files. So we talked about editing Markdown and SAS and Jinja templates. All of those source files go in this source directory. And what this Dart code does, this Dart code in bin, this Dart code is a pipeline which reads all the source files, does all those transformations, and out the other end, you get HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that you can upload to your web server. So let's see if we can just take a real quick look at what's in here. In terms of the way that Static Shock works, there's really just two phases that you need to think about. The first is all this stuff, which you can just think of as configuration. We are configuring a pipeline where source files go in one end, go through a bunch of transformations and come out the other end. After we've configured that pipeline, we just run this method called generate site. 
and that's where it actually pumps the files through and they, out they come the other end. So let's prove that this actually does what I'm suggesting to you that it does. I told you this is a Dart project, which means we should be able to Dart. Well, actually, who, who can tell me the very first thing I should do in a Dart project to avoid blowing up? Dart pub git, yes, thank you. Because we have dependencies, we need to actually get those dependencies. So we'll run Dart pub git. Okay, we looked at the pub spec file, downloaded all the dependencies. But now I told you that this is a Dart project and there's this bin directory with some Dart code in it, so we should be able to Dart run that code. So Dart run bin fsv.dart. All right, what's all this output that we've got? We've got a whole bunch of stuff here. So we're, we're generating a static site with static shock. We're loading layouts and components. We're indexing stuff. We're picking, picking files from the source set. We're loading pages and assets. This is the pipeline running right here. And you'll now notice that we have this build file. And in this build file, we have an index.html file. We didn't have an index.html in the source set, right? We had index.markdown, but now it's an HTML file. And where did all this HTML come from? It came from this homepage.jinja file, which is a template. You can see, for example, that here's where the title gets injected when it goes through the pipeline. Come down here, here's where all the markdown content gets injected when it goes through the pipeline. And what we end up with is index.html, where we have a title of welcome, and then down here, we have this HTML content, which was converted from Markdown. We also have a bunch of images. These are all favicons and that kind of stuff that all these different browsers like to show you nowadays. But these were just copied directly over, copied from the source into the, into the build destination. Now, I will say it's pretty annoying to write Dart run, lib, whatever, every time. So there is a, a shortcut for brevity. You can say shock build. And that's going to give you the same output. It's going to do the same thing, um, but it's easier to remember. You have shock create, you have shock build. You also have shock serve. So you can see here that we're serving on port 4000. So if I come over here and I say local host 4000, there's our index.html. So you kind of have the full create, build, serve capability here, which is table stakes for all of these static site generators. But again, the core concept here is that we're not applying these templates on our web server. We're not converting Markdown on the web server. We're doing it right here on our laptop and then with all those static files, we send them up to the web server. Uh, and I mentioned GitHub Pages, and it's true that GitHub Pages only works out of the box with Jekyll, but you can configure a GitHub action to run any static site generator you want. And so here at staticshock.io, this is a web page that is built and hosted by GitHub Pages. In fact, if we come over here to Guides, one of the guides is how to deploy to GitHub Pages. And so in here, I kind of explain what you need to do and why you need to do it. But there's a, a special directory that you can place these YAML configurations in. And when you push that up to GitHub, GitHub reads that configuration where you can define jobs like the one that actually runs the build. And, you can, and there's also the job that deploys to GitHub Pages. And if you set that up, you only have to configure probably two or three lines different from what I have here. And once you set that up, your Static Shock website uh, will build and deploy every time you merge into the main branch of your repository. So that's how this, the actual Static Shock website works. Now, my focus uh, for the near term is actually to help developers create guide websites just like this. So Static Shock eventually should be useful for any static website you want to create. But if you start looking through Pub, even many of the most popular packages do not have useful guides. They have API docs, and if you go read about the classes and methods, maybe you'll figure something out. But they lack websites that actually say, here are the common things that you should accomplish with this package, and here's how to accomplish them. My hope is that if Static Shock has a theme built in that you can create in a matter of seconds and then fill it with your guides, 
more open source package authors will start to publish these guide websites. And then we kind of all benefit from that. We all learn more about how to use open source packages. So that's my immediate goal. Again, this thing, I've been working on it for about a month. There's all sorts of things that are already filed against this project that need to get done. But if you'd like to check it out, again, it's Static Shock CLI on Pub. It's uh, Static Shock for the core pipeline itself. You can go to staticshock.io. See what you can do with it. Feel free to file issues on, on uh, GitHub and we'll take the project as far as we can. Then before I finish up here, let me, let me do just a few follow-ups. Um, so first, I mentioned the Flutter Bounty Hunters, uh, and I mentioned that we work exclusively on open source Flutter and Dart, and we do that professionally. And the way that works is that many companies have needs that are not relevant to their primary business, but they're still things that somebody has to build for them. So either they have to hire developers internally to build those tools, or they have to look external. What we offer are development services where we will create those non-core business tools and we'll help companies actually share funding. So if two, three, five companies all need the same thing, they can cut their cost down by 50%, 60%, 70% and share that burden. We build those open source tools, we maintain them. Uh, so if you're interested in supporting any of those projects, go check out flutterbountyhunters.com. And then also, if you'd like for me to personally help your team or your company with proprietary work, you can go to superdeclarative.com. That's where I offer my proprietary Flutter and Dart services. And the last thing I wanted to bring up is that, uh, you know, I'm wondering if it would be useful for us to maybe get together for co-working from time to time. I mean, this meetup is great. We get together every two to three months. But uh, I know I, I bounce around a lot of the cafes here um, from downtown Palo Alto to Mountain View to Sunnyvale. And perhaps if some of us got together and work, you know, did our work as a group, we might learn some things from each other. We can find out what each of us is working on. Uh, we can deduplicate some efforts, maybe join together on some open source tools. So I, mean, I told Google to give me a short URL, and this is what they call a short URL. So I guess take a photo of that form link uh, if you're interested, and then uh, feel free to fill that out. And if there's enough interest, I'll see if I can schedule some kind of shared location where every week, every two weeks or something, we can get together and, and do some Flutter and Dart work.